Well, the respiratory system performs a gas exchange between the atmosphere and the circulatory system, bringing in oxygen and discarding carbon dioxide, which is a waste product from the breakdown of carbohydrates. To maintain the necessary gas exchange rate, you must respire over 2 million liters of air every day. To accomplish this, <clears throat> this phenomenal task, you were provided with the, the most amazing lungs that are packed with about 600 million tiny little air sacs called alveoli. Now, the purpose of these tiny sacs is to increase surface area for gas exchange. If these sacs were flattened out, they would cover an area of about 1,000 square feet. That's about the size of a tennis court. There are also many molecular machines in the lungs called cilia that uh, make your lungs self-cleaning. These small motorized hairs constantly remove particulates that are filtered out of the air when trapped in mucus. It brings that mucus up into your esophagus where you swallow it. Well, a cross-section of the cilium reveals the structural components, uh, structural engineering and design that is found there. Or this, this is a three-dimensional engineering diagram for the National Library of Medicine. So they, they actually make engineering diagrams of some of these cellular structures because they are engineered. See, they make engineering, de design, I mean, engineering diagrams, but they fail to acknowledge or recognize what, that behind engineering, there's an engineer. Behind designs, there's a designer. They refuse or fail to acknowledge the obvious implications of their observations that the human body was designed. Well, the cilia moves side to side in a wave-like manner due to motor proteins. Uh, one of them is called a diene. I'll, circle, I'll just show you how these cilia work. The diene is basically a motor protein that reaches over and grabs a hold of the neighboring strand and pushes down on it. But uh, you don't want the, these, these, these tubes, these these are microtubules, which was, is the same uh, molecule that that kinesin was walking down. It's used as a highway in one part of the cell. It's used uh, to make the cilium in this case. And they're actually also used to pull the chromosomes apart during cell division. But here it's a, so there's structural, mo structural molecules that are often used in forms of movement. But it has uh, these diene proteins will reach over, grab hold of the neighboring, neighboring microtubule and push down on it in much the same way that your muscle fibers, we'll called the myosin, reaches over and grabs a hold of the neighboring actin fiber and pushes on it, performing contraction. That's how the muscle cell shortens up. So it's a similar kind of mechanism. But you don't want these uh, microtubules to slide past one another. You want it to bend. And so there's another protein there called the nexin that keeps the microtubules together so that they bit, the whole structure bends rather than sliding adjacent to one another. Michael Behe, a professor at uh, Lehigh University, describes the cilia as irreducibly complex in this way. He says, what components are needed for the cilium to work? Cilium motion re certainly requires microtubules, otherwise there would be no strands to slide. Additionally, it requires the motor proteins, the dienes, or else the microtubules of the cilium would lie stiff and motionless. Furthermore, it requires those nexin linkers to hold on a neighboring strand, converting the sliding motion into bending motion and preventing the structure from falling apart. All of these are required to perform one function, ciliary motion. Well, there's even a re more remarkable molecular machine in the respiratory system that performs the last phase of what is called respiration. It's actually called cellular respiration. And, and it is this process that produces the carbon dioxide that we must breathe off from the breakdown of glucose, and it's why we need oxygen. Now, this machine is built from 500 individual protein subunits, and it's a turbine engine, which makes the molecule ATP. It works by proton motive force. Protons flow through it to drive this machine, much like electrons flow through our machines to drive them. But it's a complex turbine engine. Uh, irreducibly complex, for sure. Well, the circulatory system is a network of transportation vessels responsible for delivering materials to and from the 100 trillion cells in your body. Materials are transported for the respiratory system, the digestive system, the excretory system, and the endocrine system. To accomplish this monumental task, the adult body was equipped with close to 100,000 miles of blood vessels. 100,000 miles of blood vessels. 
to understand how mind-blowingly large this network of vessels is, if your blood vessels were lined up end to end, they would form a, they would circle the earth not just once or twice, but four times. Your blood vessels would go around the earth four times. The circumference of the earth is 25,000 miles. You have close to 100,000 miles of blood vessels. Well, to deliver blood through such a massive network of uh, vessels requires an incredibly hardworking pump. Your heart beats 100,000 times each day, 40 million times a year, 3 billion times during the average human, human lifespan. It pumps a total of 1.5 gallons every minute. That's enough to fill, a, fill 40 50 gallon drums every day, a million barrels in the average human lifespan. In one hour, the heart outputs the energy necessary to lift almost 2,000 pounds, that's one ton, three foot off the ground. That's uh, the weight of a small car or an elephant. If the skeletal muscles, like your biceps or your triceps, tried to do what the heart does, they would be useless within minutes. I mean, you can't sit there and just keep pumping something over and over and over again the way the heart does. You would, they would cramp up, fatigue, become useless. Well, one other very important function of the circulatory system is blood clotting, which prevents blood loss when a vessel is damaged, when your body is damaged. To do this, the blood was, uh, was, has a special and very complex repair procedure in place. Once initiated by a cut, one component in the process is activated, which in turn activates another component, another component, another component, and so on and so on in a series of cumulative, mutually dependent steps. This physiological chain of production, a cascade as they call it, results in the formation of a solid obstruction, a clot, in order to seal over the damaged wound. Well, some of the main components of the clotting cascade are proteins. I'll, this is a, a diagram to show you, kind of impress upon you the complexity of this process. There's fibrinogen and prothrombin, also proaccelerant, another called Stewart factor. Well, none of these are used for any other purpose in the blood except blood clotting. Now, this is a highly regulatory, regulated process, and it needs to be, because all the components that are necessary to make a clot for your blood to harden up are there in your bloodstream. And if there's ever an error or some kind of problem in this process, if it wasn't self-limiting or regulated the way it is, your blood could just all harden up. All of your bloodstream could just harden up. So it is self-limiting to ensure that coagulation does not occur erroneously or, the, again, the entire, your entire bloodstream would just harden up. The system is very finely tuned to result in a process that achieves just the right repair at just the right place and just the right time to stop beating and bleeding and begin the process of healing. Well, Michael Behe, uh, who we met before in his book, uh, Darwin's Black Box, has noted that the blood clotting cascade is also an example of irreducible co complexity. He said the removal or degradation of just one, any one, of the components or steps would cause the cascade to fail. Obviously, this would have dire consequences for the organism. It is exceedingly difficult to see how the clotting cascade could have evolved as any postulated, simplified, or primitive version of the process would result in failure. Well, the immune system, also a part of the circulatory system and your lymphatic system, as well as your integumentary system, is responsible for providing protection from infectious organisms and viruses. And again, multiple systems are involved here that are inter they're interdependent, for, you mentioned the circulatory system. The skeletal system is also involved. It makes cells for the immunity system. Well, and it has multiple specialized cells. We call these collectively white blood cells. We only, but they're not really white. The only reason we call them white blood cells is because your red blood cells are red, and uh, they're not red, so we call them white blood cells. But there's several different kinds of white blood cells, to, uh, uh, such as lymphocytes, uh, the B cells, T cells, natural killer cells are all lymphocytes. There's also the eating cells, cells that eat things. Uh, the neutrophils and the macrophages are your eating cells. Here's a picture of a neutrophil. These are cells that just eat things that shouldn't be in the body. This is a neutrophil eating uh, some bacteria. 
The neutrophil is the yellow. This is a scanning a colorized scanning electron micrograph image. The neutrophil is the yellow cell that's eating the rod-shaped bacteria. That's actually the bacteria that causes anthrax. And watch this video. This is a video of a neutrophil chasing down a bacteria. So you have autonomous cells running around inside your body, moving around in an amoeboid manner. There are single-cell organisms called amoeba. The white blood cells move in the same way. They're ame amoeboid movement, running around the body to, and to looking, for, looking for things that shouldn't be there and eat them. The macrophage is a bigger version of a neutrophil. A neutrophil can eat about 10 things, 10 bacteria, before it dies. The macrophage, the big eater, uh, can eat about a 100. Well, one of the coolest parts of this process is the way the immunity system cells cooperate to reach a decision about how to respond to infections. Now, fighting different infections requires different types of responses, whether it be a bacterial or a fungal infection or a viral infection or a cancer. Your immunity system also takes care of your cancer cells. And so the white blood cells communicate to make a decision in an interactive process called antigen presentation. Now, what, you're, what happens is you first have a cell that eats something. Uh, things that your white blood cells eat are just generally referred to as antigens. And so first a cell eats something, one of these antigens that shouldn't be in the body. Then he breaks it up into a bunch of pieces and it presents one of those pieces to a T helper cell. He literally pre presents it with one of those pieces. He's like, I found this in the body. This shouldn't be here. What do we want to do about this? There's a process called antigen presentation. And then this helper, this T helper cell helps make a decision about what to do. For example, uh, maybe it's a cancer cell. It's one of your cells. And if so, then we activate the killer T cells to go out and kill those. Or maybe it's a bacteria or, or virus and we need to activate the macrophages, the big eaters, to go and eat those things. Or it activates the B cells to make antibodies. Now, antibodies are basically proteins. Here's a picture of what's, what some antibodies look like. Antibodies are proteins that label things for destruction. So they're labels. It'll, it'll attach to whatever shouldn't be there, whether it's a bacteria, a virus, or even one of your cancer cells. It'll attach to those and label them for destruction. But the antibodies also interfere with viral replication. So they're very, very important part of uh, your immunity system. And it's when you have antibodies is when you're immune. The reason why they give us uh, uh, vaccin vaccines for, for uh, flus and these kind of things is it gives your body a chance to develop the antibodies. So when you encounter the virus for real, you already have the antibodies ready to go. Well, this is a very lock and key specific kind of system. The, an antibody only binds to one foreign particle. An antibody only binds to one antigen, and the cell that makes an antibody only makes one antibody. But you do not have those antibodies, and you do not have those cells that make the antibody until you encounter the foreign substance. Because your body has to make a new gene. These are proteins. The protein that is in, in your body, the DNA is an instruction that tells cells how to make proteins. Your body cannot make that antibody yet because it has to make a first make a new gene. Let me show you how this works. So uh, this is pretty amazing. And this process for making antibody well illustrates the design that's behind genetic variability. You have probably thousands of genes today that you were not born with. Your body's making new genes to make antibodies to give you immunity to foreign things. Well, uh, antibodies are again produced by those white blood cells that we call B cells, but only after encountering a foreign substance in the body. And they do this by making a new gene from several gene templates that are labeled V, D, and J segments. They stand for variable diversity and joining segments. So there's 400 possible V gene segments and, the, and, and that can be used to make this new antibody gene, and the cell chooses one of them. It, combine, it, then there's, it, it is combined with one out of 15 possible D segments. It'll pick 15 different D segments, it'll pick one of those, and there's four different possible J segments, it picks one of those, and assembles these templates of a gene together to make a new gene to label, uh, to make this antibody. But 
The, with these available gene templates, a total of 24,000 genes can be made. By assembling these different templates together, a total of only 24,000 genes can be made, but the body has the ability to make an almost unlimited number of antibodies, literally millions. How does it make millions of antibodies from a limited number of gene templates? A total of 24,000 can be made. And this stumped your evolutionists for years, stumped them. And in classic evolutionary thinking, they assumed that as it was splicing together these templates, it did so very haphazardly, very randomly, creating mutations, overlaps and mutations were entered in. So it was almost just randomly making new, these antibody template, these antibody genes. And that one of those would label those, uh, would label those foreign antigens. They just assumed mutations were responsible. And classic evolutionary thinking. But they eventually discovered that what happens is after it assembles these templates together, the cell comes through, the B cell comes through, and makes single nucleotide edits to this gene to make the exact protein that's necessary to label that foreign antigen. It's an amazing, amazing thing. But it illustrates that genetic variability is by design. Well, there's even a more amazing thing and that's, uh, that the immunity system does. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, that was a, there's a dis recent discovery that revealed how white blood cells are able to locate damaged or infected tissues. Now, what you're going to see in this video are red blood cells being swept along at high velocity in the blood plasma. Red blood cells are uh, suspended in the liquid of the blood called blood plasma. But then along the top of the blood vessel wall, you'll see white blood cells. The red, the blue things that you see there are white blood cells. They are not, white blood cells are not being swept along with the blood like the red blood cells are. Instead, <clears throat> the white blood cells that we call leukocytes are crawling along, slowly along, attached to the blood vessel wall. They make protein to protein connections with the blood vessel wall. The white blood cell has proteins that are extending up. The blood vessel wall has proteins that are extending down. It makes a, it makes, it, it continues to make and reform connections with the blood vessel wall as it crawls along the blood vessel wall, breaking and reforming this as it travels slowly towards inf infection. Then at the site of inflammation, where there's an infection, these proteins are activated, which change shape, come up and contact, make contacts with the red blood cell wall. What happens then those proteins that the white blood cell is interacting with stop the white blood cell in its tracks. Once immobilized, the white, a dramatic reorganization of the white blood cell takes place, resulting in a flattening out of one edge, which is, uh, it then inserts itself between the endothelial cells of the blood vessel wall, migrates through the blood vessel wall to the infective tissue and fights, the, fights off the infection. Just amazing. It's amazing, some of this stuff that they dis they've discovered. Well, there's even a more remarkable uh, function that the circulatory system performs, and that is temperature regulation. Temperature regulation. Your body can open and close almost any blood vessel that you have. It does throw, it does throw when, you, when you have a damaged blood vessel uh, through vas vasoconstriction, but the capillaries, the smaller blood vessels, are, can be controlled as well. So your body can open and close almost any blood vessel in the body, and it does so for many reasons, but one of them is temperature regulation. So if you're ever like playing a sport and you get really hot, you'll notice that people often get red in their face because blood vessels in the surface of the skin are opened up to help you radiate off heat. Or when you get cold, it'll close down those blood vessels to help you conserve heat. It's an amazing level of control that the body has over your circulatory system. But an even more extreme revision of blood flow occurs at the exact moment of birth. Now, this, there's a, a modification of the circulatory system in a developing, uh, a developing baby that is necessary because before birth, the lungs... And the liver, in particular, are not yet active. The mother does the breathing for the baby, and the mother is, is processing the metabolites for the baby as well. So those two organs and others are not receiving, do not receive blood flow until the moment of birth. 
So because of these differences, special modifications in the fetal circulatory system permit the blood to bypass the lungs and the liver. I'll uh, highlight a couple of them for you here. One's called the foramen ovulae. This allows blood to pass directly from the right atrium to the left atrium. Normal, normally, blood comes back from the body, goes in the right atrium, down into the right ventricle, and then out to the lungs through the pulmonary artery. This causes blood to go straight from the right atrium to the left atrium, and then out the aorta to the body. Another, called the ductus, ductus arteriosus, causes blood that makes it in the pulmonary artery to be diverted to the aorta and onto the body. At birth, the lungs and other organs become active for the first time, and these developmental modifications are closed off. The foramen ovulae and the ductus arteriosa close almost immediately, causing the blood to move into the pulmonary artery and to the lungs for the first time at the moment of birth. The ductus venosus, that I'll highlight for you there as well, allows blood to bypass the immature liver, and it's closed off as well, or allowing blood to go to the liver for the first time at the moment of birth. Well, fetal development is a remarkable process wherein a single cell, remember at one point you were just a single cell, that single cell divides multiple times, and then the individual cells are assigned their roles in the body, a process called differentiation. Muscle cells, nerve cells, photoreceptor cells, all these cells, remember, came from the same original cell. And those specialized roles are taken on through the regulation of gene expression. Different genes are turned on or off in these various cells, causing them to take on these specialized roles. But most people don't really have a good sense of how quickly development takes place after fertilization. So I want to show you something. Um, I'm going to show you a time-lapse video of embryonic development in a fish called the zebrafish. Much less complex than, hu than humans and has a much smaller genome, much fewer, much less DNA to have to copy. But uh, watch this. It starts out with one cell. Now it's divided into two. Now you can see it's divided into four, divided into eight there. Divides again. They're all divided again into 16. Then they divide again. Now you got 32. Keeps dividing. Notice amazingly it doesn't get larger in size. It just divides over and over and over again. It's copying the DNA, but the rest of the cellular content uh, remains largely the same during this process. But very quickly, it's, you start to see some structures that form. One of the first things that forms is the vertebral column, the backbone with the nerves that are inside of it because everything else branches off that. Pretty quickly, you can, uh, you can see them out in the fish is starting to take form. You could see an eye there if you look closely. Now, again, a very simple organism in comparison to human and much smaller genome, not as much DNA to have to copy before each division. But what would you think? A month? You know, uh, two months? A couple of weeks? 21 hours. That was 21 hours after fertilization. That amount of development takes place. Now, due to, the, due, to the, due to the fact that humans are much more complex and much larger genomes, the process is much slower. Let me review this for you, though. After approximately 30 hours, the fertilized egg, we call the zygote, divides into two cells. And then uh, 15 hours later, the two cells divide into four. After three days, there are 16 cells. So it's a much slower process. Five days after fertilization, the embryo is called a blastocyst. And, uh, and has about 100 cells. At this point, it is carried by cilia, those same little motor hairs, to the uterus where it becomes implanted. During the next two to three week period of time, the implanted embryo undergoes a major transformation as the cells morph into the new cell types that become the millions of specialized cells, tissues, and organs that it takes to make a baby. This intricate cellular choreography is regulated by growth factors turned on and off at specific times and locations in response to signals from the embryo's genes. At 32 days, the head and the eye lens are clearly visible. The upper and lower limbs are growing and show distinct digits. You look closely, you can see fingers. The internal organs are developing. The heart, liver, and pancreas are visible here. The heart actually starts beating at around 21 days. At one and a half months of age, the eyes and the other sensory organs are substantially developed. 
At eight weeks, they're officially known as a fetus, but I would call them a baby. Very tiny, but all of the internal organs are fully developed at this stage. Very tiny. Now, to, to uh, make a get better case of this, I want to. Sh this is at eight weeks of age, and this is a, an MRI, a magnetic resonance imaging Im image of an eight week old baby that uh, just gives you a look inside so you can see that all of the internal organs are there. They're all functioning by this point. Sadly, half of all abortions occur after this point in time. They're often convinced by abortion advocates that it's just a mass of, tissue, mass of cells, but you're talking about a fully functioning baby at this point. By the ninth week, the baby has fingerprints. At 10 weeks, they're pain capable, and they've been uh, seen to smile at 12 weeks. However, when humans are viewed as just another animal, and there's no ultimate foundation for ethics, people can justify horrible atrocities against each other, like the slaughter of helpless children. Abortion today is the number one cause of death worldwide. Sadly, by the age of 45, about one in three couples in the United States will have an abortion. And very troubling, 73% of abortions are by people with religious affiliations. The World Health Organization reported in 2021 that there are around 73 million reported abortions performed per year. That's worldwide. That's about 2.3 children per second. In the United States alone, there are nearly 1 million abortions performed per year. That's about one every 32 seconds. And we can attribute many of these deaths to the horrendous Supreme Court ruling of Roe v. Wade in 1973 that legalized abortion nationwide. Well, most of these deaths could be avoided with uh, better laws. I want to provide a quick overview of where we are legally as of 2018, only 42 states required an abortion to be performed by a licensed physician. They're performed by clinicians, not licensed physicians. Only 43 states prohibited abortions after a specific point in the pregnancy. Only 20, 20 states had laws that prohibited partial birth abortion, wherein the clinician partially delivers a baby before killing it and completing the delivery. Only 18 states mandated that a woman be given counseling before abortion. Only 27 states required a waiting period before an abortion could be performed, usually about 24 hours. Only 37 states required parental involvement in a minor's decision to have an abortion. And minors are able to have a legal abortion at any age without parental consent or notification any age. There's no age limit. You can walk into an abortion clinic and have an abortion at an age that you cannot get aspirin from your school nurse without parental consent. You cannot get an aspirin from your school nurse without the parental consent, and yet they can, these girls at the same age can walk into abortion and have a, uh, have a major surgery done that ultimately terminates the life of their child. Well, again, most of these deaths could be avoided with better laws. In 2022, you probably know the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. As a consequence, many states enacted laws either restricting or expanding abortion rights. For example, when North Carolina enacted restrictions in 2023 against abortions after 12 weeks of gestation and required in-person counseling, facility-based abortions dropped by one-third the very first month. Today, 14 states have a near-total ban in effect. That's the states in red. Others, like Oregon, Vermont, Minnesota, New Jersey, Maryland, and New Mexico, moved to legalize abortion so it could be performed all the way to birth. Many others have legalized abortion up to the point where the baby could survive on its own, what they call uh, fetal viability, uh, generally 24 to 26 weeks, so six months is kind of the cutoff for some. 
Michigan, Vermont, and California have protected abortion rights through a constitutional amendment. Their state constitution now ensures that people can kill their baby up to fetal viability and to the point of birth, respectively. Well, people are acting like they have the right to kill their children, even if they're simply going to be inconvenient. These terrible crimes are committed against the most vulnerable people in the world, and we must fight to protect them. Fight how? Join in protest marches, picket outside abortion clinics. There are also a number of pro-life organizations shown here that are lobbying today for restrictions such as dismemberment bans or the Pain Capable Protection Act. These groups could use your financial support. And we must educate people about who they really are. See, they become convinced by false teachings that they're nothing but a bunch of evolved apes. Natural science is trying their best to convince the world of a big lie, that this world formed all by itself, magically somehow or another, and we're nothing but a bunch of evolved apes. However, in Genesis 1.26 says that we are made in the image and likeness of God. Well, image and likeness are not references to physical appearance of God since Jesus says in uh, four, John 4.24 4, that God is spirit. And in Luke 24.39 that spirit does not have flesh and bones. Therefore, we can conclude that we reflect the character and attributes of God, such as compassion, rationality, Love, hatred, and fellowship. God exhibits all of these characteristics and as do people. While all creation reflects aspects of God's character, man alone was created in God's image. Man has physical distinctions his brain is a masterpiece of complexity. His hands are able to accomplish precise work. His posture is upright. Yet, it is man's spiritual nature that is especially unique. Scripture explains that God is spirit. And even though mankind has fallen into sin, man's spiritual nature still retains a glimmer of the Creator's character. For example, man has a free will. Man knows the difference between good and evil. And only mankind has produced great scientists, composers, prophets, and poets. Mankind has been engineered with brilliant physical traits. The Lord has designed all man's senses to be intimately integrated. When we see food, our stomachs may growl and our mouths salivate. Upon hearing the voice of an old friend, our hearts may leap for joy. And one smell of grandma's cooking can invoke memories from years past. However, the wonder of our physical sophistication pales in comparison to our spiritual nature. Man is self-conscious and able to contemplate himself. Man was created a rational being, endowed with the faculty of reason and the ability to learn. Man was given the capacity to retain past experiences, and his memory makes it possible for him to reflect on the goodness of God. According to the Genesis record, man was made in the image of God. That means he had attributes, abilities, capacities that God had given him. When we read the Genesis 4 record, which is after the fall, we still see these abilities and capacities. For example, man could build cities. He could make and play musical instruments. He understood metallurgy. He understood agriculture. He could write poetry and literature. As well, man was created with a spiritual component. Man had a free will to choose, had a conscience. So we see God created man unique from the rest of the creation. There are many differences between mankind and animals. One verse that comes to mind is over in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. It's the verse that says, we are special, that God has put eternity in our hearts. That is, we have a concept of history of the past and present and future. This is different from animals that live for today. 
We are a special creation. Another wonderful gift of the Creator to man is emotion. It gives him color and richness, feeling, and the capacity for joy and laughter. Only man of all creatures on earth can appreciate an inspiring symphony or rejoice in the beauty of a sunset. And man alone is a free moral agent, responsible to God and to society. The only explanation to account for morality in man is the fact revealed in the scriptures, namely, that man was created in the image of God and therefore made, like God, a moral being. Humans are truly a wonder of God's creation. We were the pinnacle, the very purpose of the creation, and we should not forget how important each and every human life is to him. King David reminds us of our importance in Psalms 8. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, the son of man that you care for him, yet you've made him a little lower than God, you have crowned him with glory and majesty. Let me close this out in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much, Lord, for... We thank you so much. Lord, for this wonderful world that you've given us, for these wonderful bodies you've given us, Father, we, uh, we ask you to help us, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Help us to be a witness to you, a witness to this world that is lost. People that are around us who don't know who they are, who think they're just an evolved animal. Help us, Lord, to protect the most innocent in this world that are, are dying these days because people don't know who they are. That they were made in the image of God. That you love us so, 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 so much. Lord, help us to be a witness for you, Father. Give us, fill us with the Holy Spirit and teach us, Lord. Teach us through your Holy Spirit and give us the words to say when the opportunities, we find the opportunities to witness for you, speak for us, Lord. Give us the words to say and give us the, motivate us, Lord, to speak, to speak the name of Jesus, to speak the name of God to whoever we encounter in the world around us. Help us to be a witness for you, Lord God. Father God, and we submit ourselves to you as your servants, as your slaves, Father, asking tonight for the forgiveness of sins. Forgive us, Lord, our sins as we forgive others. We praise you, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for this world. We thank you for your son, Yeshua, who's died for our sins. Praise you, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray all things. Amen.